In 1860, as the American experiment threatened to explode into a bloody civil war, there were as many as 400,000 slave owners in the United States and almost four million slaves. The nation was founded upon an idea that all men are created equal and endowed by their creator with the inalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And the nation would pay a bloody cost for denying that right to more than 12% of its population. But when slavery was first brought to America's shores, this war, and even the nation it tore apart, was centuries in the future. How did it come to pass that more than 10 million African men and women would be brought against their will to the new world? How could educated, deeply religious Europeans trade in human flesh as casually as they traded sugar and rice? What were the lives of American slaves like? And how did their experiences differ across the geographic span of North America, South America, and the Caribbean Isles? Or across the span of time from their first arrival on the ships of Columbus through the last days of the American Civil War? These questions and more we will seek to answer as we rise up from slavery. Steal away, steal away, steal away to Jesus. Steal away, steal away home. I ain't got long to stay. Slavery as an institution is as old as history, but the uniquely American form of slavery, enslaved Africans and their descendants forced to labor for Europeans, began when the age of exploration brought Europeans to the shores of both Africa and the Americas. When Portuguese ships began exploring the coastline of Africa in the 15th century, they sought not slaves, but gold and other riches. Successful expeditions returned with wealth and with enslaved Africans. Though initially African slaves were acquired by raids along the coast, European traders quickly established trade relations with local African slavers. Slavery was always common among the African societies, though trade with the Europeans would greatly increase the number of Africans enslaved. Regardless, African slavers had existing trade systems that could be used to meet the European needs. This was important in part because tropical Africa was a dangerous place for Europeans who proved highly susceptible to diseases on the continent. So West African kings and chiefs controlled the local slave trade. As one 18th century African described it, when a trader wants slaves, he applies to a chief for them and tempts them with his wares. According, he falls on his neighbors and as a desperate battle ensues, if he prevails and takes prisoners, he satisfies his avarice by selling them. But if his party be vanquished and he falls into the hands of the enemy, he is put to death. I was once a witness to a battle in our common. There were many women as well as men on both sides. Among others, my mother was there, and armed with a broad sword. After fighting for a considerable time with great fury, and many had been killed, our people obtained the victory. Those prisoners which were not sold or redeemed, we kept as slaves. 
The slaves in large part came from the interior regions of Africa. West African slavers would shackle them into coffles or slave chain gangs and march them to the coast, a journey that may be hundreds of miles and take many months. The very old or young often died before reaching the coast, and all the slaves were weakened from illness, exposure, and malnutrition. Their journey had only begun. Once they reached the coast, the African slaves were placed into barracoons, or holding pens, to await the European traders. They might spend weeks in these pens, growing sicker from the poor sanitation and unclean water. By the time they were ready to be loaded onto the slave ships, they were sick, hungry, dazed, and exhausted. They were thrust into the holds of ships manned by strange people who spoke a strange language. During the journey across the Atlantic, called the Middle Passage, the conditions of the slaves varied from very bad to completely horrifying. Twelve million Africans would begin this journey. One and a half million would not survive to reach their destination. Usually the men were confined in the holds at night, but allowed on deck in chains during the day. Some ship captains would forbid sexual contact between the crew and the female slaves, while others saw it as a benefit of the trade. These new slaves were generally terrified of the water, many of them never having seen the ocean and having no concept of ships. They were seasick, often refusing to eat. The ship's crews would force feed them if necessary, in hopes of delivering slaves that were healthy enough to be sellable. Experience taught slavers the importance of improved sanitation ventilation, and other steps to ensure they would deliver enough healthy slaves to make a healthy profit. But this long journey for African slaves did not begin with the first European expeditions along the African coast. Although some slaves were captured and sent to Europe, the wholesale acquisition of slaves did not become a significant goal of African trade until Christopher Columbus discovered the New World. Columbus discovered the island he would name San Salvador in October 1492. A year later, on his second voyage, he introduced sugar cane to the Caribbean islands. And the success of sugar planting in the islands, combined with the Europeans' recently discovered sweet tooth, would lead to the explosion of European enslavement of Africans. The Spanish would first attempt to use Native American slaves to work the sugar fields and Central American gold mines. But they were susceptible to disease, and unlike the African slaves, they had no prior farming skills. Natives could also more easily escape and disappear among their own people, which was obviously impossible for Africans. And finally, Using indigenous Americans meant capturing and enslaving free men, whereas Africans could simply be purchased from their own people. The first sugar grown by African slaves in the Caribbean reached Spain in 1516. By 1570, a thousand tons of sugar a year was produced by the island of Santo Domingo. Production quickly spread to other Spanish islands, such as Puerto Rico, and then, in the 1540s, to Brazil. By the end of the century, Brazil alone produced 16,000 tons of sugar each year on the backs of 100,000 African slaves. The Atlantic slave trade had begun in earnest. Over three million Africans would be shipped to work the sugarcane fields in Brazil and millions more would be sent to the Caribbean islands. In what is known as the triangle trade, slaves, sugar, and rum were traded in a profitable system, profitable for all but the African slaves. <laughs> 
Slaves would be purchased in West Africa and taken across the Atlantic, a journey known as the dreaded Middle Passage. The Africans were taken to the Caribbean islands where they would be put to work on the sugar plantations. The plantations produced sugar, which the slaves then turned into molasses. The molasses was given to the slave traders in exchange for the African slaves. The molasses was then shipped to New England colonies, where it was distilled into rum. The distillation process required burning a lot of wood. Wood was a scarce resource in the Caribbean, but plentiful in New England. The rum was then given to the traders as payment for the molasses. The European slave traders returned to Africa, where they exchanged the rum for more slaves to be put to work on the Caribbean sugar plantations. The slave trade was initially controlled by the Spanish and Portuguese, who in the early 16th century dominated the seas. The first African slaves in North America were in Spanish colonies in the early 1500s. The San Miguel Guadalupe colony was formed in the area that would become the Carolinas. That colony experienced a revolt in 1526, in which there was a struggle over leadership. The slaves took the opportunity to revolt as well, and they escaped to live with the local natives. The colony was then abandoned. The Spanish San Agustin colony in Florida, founded in 1565, was the first permanent European settlement in North America. This settlement also had African slaves. As Spanish and Portuguese power waned, the Dutch and then the British became the primary slave trading nations. By the time Britain had entered the slave trade, over 600,000 Africans had already been shipped across the Atlantic to the New World. It was Dutch traders who brought the first Africans to the British colonies in North America. In 1619, Dutch traders brought about 20 Africans to Jamestown in the colony of Virginia. These Africans likely served as indentured servants, as would other Africans brought to North American British colonies in the early 17th century. But slavery grew slowly in North America. Unlike the British Caribbean, where British colonies put tens of thousands of African slaves to work on sugar plantations, the North American colonies did not immediately require the manpower that slavery could provide. That changed with the growth of the tobacco industry in the Chesapeake region of Virginia in the 1620s and 1630s, though it did not truly take off until the 1660s. Thanks for watching. If you'd like to help us produce more compelling historical content like this, please like, comment below, and share this video with fellow history buffs. And of course, be sure to subscribe to help keep history happening.